<laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear me. Welcome to our uh, inaugural event here in this uh, wonderful auditorium in the uh, new headquarters of the EBRD. Uh, welcome to the launch of our 2022-2023 transition report, Business Unusual. There you are with a good uh, picture there to uh, illustrate it. The event's organized by the Office of the Chief Economist here at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. My name is Jonathan Charles. And as many of you may know, I'm the former Managing Director of Communications and Business Information Services here at the EBRD. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to this uh, first public event that the EBRD is having in our new headquarters in Canary Wharf. Uh, this is one of the greenest buildings in the UK, which is absolutely in tune with the EBRD's own values as well. Uh, a warm welcome to those people who are joining online. Uh, a warm welcome to the many alumni as well that I can see uh, both here in the room and indeed I know are are joining us online. So the transition report, let's look at that. Uh, a global pandemic, lockdowns, supply chain disruption, war in Europe, rocketing gas prices, forced mass migration, high inflation, growing debt burdens, reshoring, friendshoring. It's quite a, a non-exhaustive list, even though it's quite an exhausting list uh, of all the challenges. And of course, uh, there, that would be more than enough of a challenge all of those things for governments and businesses to manage over a whole decade. And yet all those things have happened over the past three years. And there's no sign that the turbulence is about to end. Perma crisis was named the word of 2022 by the Collins Dictionary earlier this month. Uh, it's defined as an extended period of instability and insecurity. Or in other words, it's really what this new transition report is all about. Business unusual. How will policymakers and businesses cope with this prolonged period of shocks and uncertainty? That's what we're going to be discussing over the next hour and a bit. Uh, but first of all, we're going to start by hearing from the EBRD president, Odile Renaud Vassal, who will share her thoughts on these uncertain times. Odile. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Good to have you to see you back here. And um, good afternoon. The launch of the transition report is always an important event for the EBRD, a very important moment in the EBRD's calendar, always in November, um, because it showcases what our economists think and uh, what, how they view the state of transition in the countries where we invest our countries of operation. And this year's launch is very specific for two re positive reasons. The first one is the first launch in person of the transition report we have after two years of COVID and um, November was uh, in the last two years quite a difficult time for COVID and it's also the first major public event we have here in this building and in this uh, auditorium and so it's also I mean our new home in Canary Wharf and we moved there I mean one month ago one depending on whom but this launch comes also at a very traumatic time, traumatic year for all of us in the EBRD world. War has returned to the European continent. And I was discussing this morning with Phil Bennett and he told me I would never have expected the transitional report to have a tank in the, I mean, as a front page. So I, it, say, it says something about where we are. And it's inflicting suffering for millions of people in our region. This devastation follows several shocks to the global economy and geopolitics, and if only, I mean, just recall the pandemic and its impact, the disruption of value chain, inflationary situation, and so forth. So for businesses, the, wor the world is changing extremely fast and is really entering unknown territories, I believe. That's why Business Unusual, I think we could not even have imagined a better title than this. Um, it, really, it really reflects this new uncertainty and how to deal about it. So the report explores the new economic landscape, focusing on issues that are particularly relevant on, at the current juncture. First of all, it looks at, it puts the experience of wartime economies and post-war economic reconstruction into a historical perspective. And that's really very useful for the time being. It also examines the largest forced displacement of people in Europe since the forties. And 
we have been facing this year and maybe new ways will I mean will come we don't know been facing I mean very very large inflows of displaced people within Europe but also within countries it charts the macro the major shifts in global value chains as a result of recent disruption and geopolitical tension and this is also a very deep I think movement we are seeing developing and Last but not least, it looks at governments and companies mounting debt burdens, as well as the sharp increases in energy and food prices. So I think all these four issues are completely and fully relevant for everything we are doing and every, every question our countries of operation are facing and business are facing in these countries. So very looking forward to hear from today's panel that will share, they will share their insight on this report and the big underlying trends which are defining business and investment decisions in this most unpredictable and unusual world. Thank you for being here. And I will now pass the floor to Beata to introduce the panel or to Jonathan to introduce the panel, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Odile, for uh, the opening address and setting the scene of where we are. So let's uh, go into really the nuts and bolts of this transition report, the details which explain why we're talking about business unusual. I'd like to ask Beata Javorczyk, who is the EBRD chief economist, to uh, delve into the pages of the, this document, this report. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to present to you this year's transition report. Its title, Business Unusual, captures the spirit of the time. There is a war raging on the European continent, unprecedented displacement of people, so forced displacement of people, largest since the 1940s, upending of global value chains, and record high levels of indebtedness among businesses and governments. These are the four issues, the four themes that we address in the four analytical chapters of this report. This presentation is short. It's not going to do justice to the rich content of the report, but I hope that after seeing some of the highlights, uh, you will be encouraged to reach for the report and read at least part of it. So starting with the theme of the economics of war, we look at the experience of conflict over the last 200 years to see how conflicts have been changing and to see what has been happening to the economies during conflict and post-war. The good news is that since the 1990s, the number of conflicts have gone down, but the prevalence of civil wars has increased. We also see that financing of wars has changed. Wars, war efforts rely predominantly on domestic borrowing. Printing money seems to have gone out of fashion after World War I. And taxing, for obvious reasons, is not a very promising source of revenue. But what's different now is that foreign financing has become much more prominent since the time of World War II. Now, in the core of the report, we look at the experiences of economies of war. We focus on wars between states and we narrow our attention to countries uh, who fought wars on their territory. And then we find a comparator group, a group of countries that were not engaged in any conflict, countries that were similar in terms of income per capita, in terms of growth and population to the countries that would engage in a war later on. And this group of comparators give us, gives us the missing counterfactual. What would have happened to the country in question had it not engaged in a war effort? So not surprisingly, you see that during the wartime inflation goes up on average by 8%, though the good news is that inflation tends to come down after the war is finished. When it comes to public debt, not as surprisingly, it increases during the war. That's because of this domestic borrowing being used to finance war effort. And the increase in the debt to GDP level continues in the first few years after the conflict is over, peaking at almost 
47% of GDP relative to the pre-war trend. What is the most depressing part of the report is the statistic that indicates that in half of the cases, countries that were engaged in an interstate war that was fought on their territory do not return to their GDP per capita level uh, after quarter of a century. So that means that half of the countries that experience war see their GDP per capita remaining below the pre-war trend quarter of a century later. So wars leave deep scars on the economies. They leave deep scars on the size of the labor force as well as on the capital stock. And what's the lesson we can draw from this? Well, the narrative about reconstruction of Ukraine focuses very much on rebuilding the physical capital stock. But preserving human capital is equally important. So in order to position Ukraine well for the future reconstruction, it's important um, to prevent another massive wave of refugees. And here, EBRD is doing its part by supporting rapid repairs, by supporting um, government budget through its financing to naphtha gas, to electricity sector, and to railways. Now, moving on to the second chapter, which zooms in on forced displacement of people. Over the last decade and a half or two decades, we've seen an increase in the number of people displaced globally. And this year, we are on course for this number to exceed 100 million people globally. You see the dark bars at the bottom, these are refugees. Then the light blue bars capture asylum seekers. And then you see the big blue bars, which are internally displaced people. So we've seen very fast increase in the number of both people crossing the borders, being displaced by war and conflict, and people who are displaced within their own countries. Now, if you look at the narrative, at the discussion um, in many advanced economies, you would think that most refugees are hosted by rich countries. But actually, three quarters of refugees are, are hosted by middle income and low income countries. And if you look at the number of refugees relative to the population size, Jordan and Lebanon stand out. In Jordan, the number of refugees is equal to one third of the native population size. In Lebanon, it's a fifth. But you also see countries like Turkey, Czech Republic, Moldova, Poland. These are our countries of operations, uh, which host quite a significant number of refugees relative to their size. Now, what is Different when it comes to statistics on Ukrainian refugees is that we observe not only the number of arrivals, but also the number of people leaving. While the previous statistics that I showed you are based mostly on the recorded arrivals. So if you look at Poland, about 5 million people cross Polish border. Out of that, 1.2 million was still there in midsummer. 440,000 where people were absorbed by the labor market. They found employment in Poland. Large number of refugees either returned to Ukraine or moved to other countries. We also see many people crossing the border into other neighboring countries, um, many people arriving in Hungary, Romania, Slovak Republic, and Moldova, though many of them moving in, moving on to third countries. In the report, we go deeper into um, the question of refugees. We document the fact that attitudes towards refugees have become much more positive um, in Eastern European countries. We also show that refugees have been quite satisfied with access to schooling, with the way they have been welcomed by local populations. We present many statistics also on determinants of what of drivers of destinations chosen 
by the refugees, presence of family and friends, closeness to the border were two of the most important reasons how refugees chose the country they went to. Now, in the third chapter of the report, we focus on global value chains. Our countries of operations, particularly advanced transition countries, uh, are very well integrated in the global value chains. But the recent turbulence has seen people rethinking and questioning resilience of global value chains. Um, the war has served as a trigger to start the process of reshuffling, of reorganization of the global value chains. And that's not because Russia, Belarus, or Ukraine are very integrated in the global value chains, but rather because the war made it clear that geopolitical tensions are not going away anytime soon. So one of the statistics that we present in the report comes from a representative survey of 4,000 German firms. This is a survey we did together with the German IFO Institute. And you see that 90% of manufacturing firms have taken concrete actions to improve resilience of their value chains. Two thirds of firms have increased inventories they hold. So there is a movement from just in time to just in case approach. But perhaps what's more important is two thirds of firms have increased the number of suppliers. They have diversified their supplier base. And what's important for our readers of operations is how German firms perceive reliability of suppliers in our countries of operations. You can see that suppliers in Central Europe, in Southern Europe, in Western Balkans, or in North Africa are perceived as being more reliable than Asian, South Asian, or Chinese suppliers. And that presents an opportunity that as this process continues, our countries of operations could capture part of the market, of the European uh, market share. And the process will continue because in the same survey, half of German firms told us that they plan to add additional suppliers within the coming year. Now, Jonathan mentioned perma crisis as a new word that was coined in recent months. French shoring is another word that has that was added to our vocabulary. French shoring means trading with countries that share your values, that, um, that share your politics. And in a simulation exercise in the report, we asked what would happen if the world took French shoring seriously and split into two trading blocks along the UN vote on Ukraine? with countries supporting Ukraine being in one block and other, all other countries being in another block. So you can think of this as an extreme way of providing insurance against supply disruptions. And the warning that the report presents is such a way of providing insurance would come at a very large welfare cost. Basically, breaking trading ties, um, splitting the world into two blocks would result in large welfare costs to pretty much all countries involved. In the last chapter, we take on the issue of high indebtedness and we point out the risk of zombification, hence the graphic here. Um, firms as well as governments in our countries of operations and have, and as well globally, have taken on very high levels of debt. Um, if you look at firms in our regions of operations, 10 years ago, they were borrowing on average at the interest rate of 10%. Um, in 2020, the average interest rate was 4%. So these low interest rates encouraged firms to take on a lot of debt. Now, of course, the world has changed, interest rates are rising, and that means that the cost of additional borrowing and the cost of servicing debt is going up. And that's going to be difficult 
for weaker firms. In this environment, you would expect to see an increase in the number of bankruptcies. And yet, statistics from the new EU member states show that after the COVID pandemic, the number of bankruptcies has gone down. And that means that we don't know yet the true landscape of firms, because there are many firms that are at the verge of bankruptcies, but they have been kept alive by emergency measures that governments enacted in many countries to protect firms from creditors, or by financing lines governments have extended uh, to firms. And there is a risk that going forward, as we enter a downturn in the business cycle, as we enter um, much a period of much more difficult economic conditions, government will, governments will be under pressure to continue with that protection, thus leading to possible zombification of firms, keeping alive firms that should not be alive. And in our regions, this is a particularly acute issue because of prevalence of state-owned banks. The analysis undertaken for this chapter shows that state-owned banks are much more likely to lend to weak firms as well as to zombie firms because state-owned banks are under less pressure. They often can count on being bailed out by their governments. They may be directed by their governments to do so because no government wants to see uh, firms going out of business and big job losses. So this is a warning in this report. So these are just a few highlights from the chapters of the report. Now, where do they all leave us? Governments are fighting fires. They are dealing with lots of challenges with lots of immediate needs that need to be addressed. But the big challenge of all now is how to cope with the current shocks without losing sight of the long-term perspective, of the long-term goals of supporting green transition, of maintaining free trade, because both green transition and free trade are the foundations of future prosperity and future growth. Finally, let me just acknowledge and thank the very many people who have contributed to writing and producing of this report. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Beata. That was a really interesting, huge amount to, to get to grips uh, with uh, lots of fascinating detail. You know, probably looking at it, I think it reminds me of the challenging environments of the late 1970s when I was learning economics uh, at that point. You know, I think it's uh, in terms of all the different things that have to be navigated. So that's going to be the basis of our discussion for the next few minutes. So I'd like to ask our panel to come up and uh, take their seats here. Phil, perhaps you could sit here. Uh, Ivan next to Phil and Beata at the end, and then joining us online is uh, Sabina Vines as well from Brussels. Let me introduce our panel. Uh, to you, we have Phil Bennett, who is a former EBRD vice president and head of the client services group uh, at the bank. Uh, Ivan Krastov is a political scientist, chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. And Sabina Verand is director general for trade at the European Commission, joining us uh, remotely from Brussels today. And of course, Beata is here as well. Just a, a few housekeeping tips, by the way, before we get underway uh, with the discussion. The event is being streamed live on ebrd.com and also on Kaltura and LinkedIn. For those of you uh, watching online, please post your questions uh, in the comments below the video, uh, and I'll use them towards the end of our event. And before we really begin, we wanted to ask you, our audience, what does business unusual mean to you? We've got a, a Menti app uh, up on screen, which hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, there you go. Join the conversation at menti.com. Uh, if you are watching online, you can scan the code with your phone camera, choose one of the options. So what does business unusual mean to you? The options are disruption caused by war, inability to plan long-term, cost of living crisis, a 1997 BBC book based on Doctor Who, which apparently was called Business Unusual, uh, or all of the above. And we're going to come back to these results uh, later in the discussion. But let's turn to our guests and give them the floor to reflect on the main themes of the transition report for a few minutes each. So, uh, Ivan, let me start with you. What, what do you think is business unusual? <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, so being Bulgarian, I'm very well prepared to discuss Biznik. It's uh, unusual because uh, ordinary Bulgarians are kind of educated by two proverbs that we know from our grandparents. And the first is that too good is not for good, which means that if things go well, be prepared for something bad. But the second is nothing bad come on its own. So be prepared that something bad is going to come after that. And from this point of view, I do believe it's quite important uh, to go because for me, and I really want to genuinely to congratulate the authors, this is the first kind of a report that first takes the COVID and the war together, gives slightly longer perspective, both back and in the future. And it allows, uh, at least for me, to just stress on three things. And I'm going very much to focus on the first two chapters where I feel slightly more competent than uh, the second two. The first is what is interesting about all these statistics about the wars is that we normally, when we took and talk about the war, believe that we know when the war has ended. One of the recent developments is that basically you have a never ending wars. You have a ceasefires that are not peace. You have a wars that basically come back, and this is particularly true in the case of the civil wars, which was very much pushed in the report. And I'm saying this because this is one of the major risks that ought to exist in the case of the Russia-Ukrainian conflict. We are talking, by the way, about a big war. Uh, as uh, the Ukrainian president reported three days ago, 4,700 missiles have been basically shot against Ukraine from the beginning of the war. And uh, the level of the shells that have been shot is on the level of intensity of the 1941. So this is not a military conflict. We are talking about a big war between two big countries, one of which is a nuclear power. So what we can expect is that at some point, obviously, they're going to be ceasefire, but this ceasefire does not need to become peace, which is recognized. And here is the first story, how the businesses are going to react to this when reconstruction is going to start. Is it going to be a post-war reconstruction? Or to what extent the reconstruction should start immediately, keeping in mind that, for example, 50% of the energy infrastructure of Ukraine is destroyed. So this, in my view, are going to be political decision, but also business decisions. When the private investors are going to feel kind of secure enough to enter back. Uh, and this also very much, in my view, is related to the problem of migration. We saw the figures, and this is interesting, and I'm going to touch uh, on this uh, uh, in the next minute, but there is one major difference between the incredibly big forceful movement of people after World War II and now. The movement of people after World War II has as its objective creating a more ethnically homogeneous states. Basically, you have a minority groups, taking out of certain countries and putting back basically to where the majority population is. The Germans from Central and Eastern Europe basically were forced to go back to Germany, but you have this happening on many levels. Here we're going to have a movement of people which is going to very much increase the diversity of the societies. And on one level, I do believe this is particularly important for Europe, which has a major demographic uh, crisis, aging and shrinking population. But of course, in a democracy, it means that migration and anti-migration sentiments are going to remain central for the politics of it. And from this point of view, I'll go to my second point. And the second point is, I'll be interested, and I do believe that there is a very interesting data in the report, to see also the financial dimensions of what is happening and the migration part of it as a second coming of the two previous crises that shattered Europe, the global financial crisis and the refugee crisis of 2015-16. Because what is interesting is on one level continuations, but also major differences. Differences in the policy responses. Remember during the refugee crisis, basically we're talking about East Europeans not being interested to get 10,000 uh, uh, Syrian refugees. At the moment, we're talking about more than 1.5 million people living in Poland alone. And it's not simply that people are there, but many of these people, at least at some point, 7% of the house, Polish households has an Ukrainian refugees living with them. So this is kind of a big change 
And this change should be realized because it shows that when we're talking about migration and these issues, it is not easy to compare from country to country. And this is, listen, it's easy to say that this is simply about religion, culture, and so on. It might be something much deeper. The war which people identified with. For the Poles in a certain way, and we have a lot of surveys, this is their war. So they're treating differently people coming from there. Uh, but what is important is that we have a similar phenomenon in Turkey uh, when the war in Syria started. And for several years, there was a very much integration of the Syrian refugees going to Turkey. They went into a labor market, and then you have a major increase of the anti-refugee sentiments. I'm saying this because it also means that if they're not going to be effective policies to integrate the people, this welcoming cannot be taken forever staying in the way it is. And in political terms, it makes a huge, uh, huge difference. And my last point is about uh, the last thing that was said about uh, the French Rank and basically the limits of the French Rank. Uh, because in Europe, what you saw as a result of the war was a very major consolidation of a basically Western allies as a response to the Russian aggression. This is not exactly how the global South reacted. Uh, we can see people voting in the United Nations uh, condemning Russia, but the majority of the democracies that President Biden invited on the summit for democracy do not sanction Russia. Why I'm saying this, because while we are very much trying to see the future as going back to a Cold War, well-disciplined blocks, which are trade blocks, political blocks, geopolitical blocks, what I'm seeing is something very different. We see an incredible activism of the middle powers, very different countries, Turkey, Brazil, South Arabia, India, which are much more trying to find a more relevance in place for them in this international system that are much more unpredictable. Uh, this is not a kind of a new non-alignment movement. These people are not going easily to go together. But from this point of view, I do believe that taking into consideration how the activism of the middle powers are going to shape also the trade and political relations is something that we should take seriously. Thank you very much. Interesting start to the, to the discussion. I mean, and I, I think particularly showing the fragmentation almost of the, of the world that we're seeing in some ways, whilst also consolidation in other ways. So it's a, it's a bit of a schizophrenic uh, approach. Phil, what's your take on all of this? First of all, it's great to be back. It's great to see all of you. Uh, it's really lovely to walk the halls and see so many people that I have great memories of. Um, secondly, I'd like to welcome all the alumni because as you know, the only better thing than being an, uh, an EVRD staffer is to be an alumni. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate it. I hope all of you appreciate it. And thanks to George for bringing everybody together. Um, business unusual. I'm looking forward a little bit. So I'm looking forward to the, I'm not actually looking forward with great anticipation, but I'm considering going forward to the, the fact that there's no going back. If you want to go back to what you thought was normality, give it up. Um, we are in a different environment and we have to really accept it. Now, first of all, I want to say thanks to Odile, Beata, and, and Jonathan for inviting me here and giving this, me this opportunity to speculate on things that are a little bit beyond my intellectual capacity, but I will try. Um, but the themes here seem somewhat independent when you first look at them, but they're actually very well interconnected, overlapping, um, and very well worked together. So I, I encourage you, and this is for all the people that don't have a bookshelf anymore in this building, but if you do have a bookshelf, don't leave it on it, Put it on your desk and pick this up because there are a lot of data nuggets in it that will reshape your assumptions about reconstruction and Europe and supply chains. And there are facts that really help you do this. So I, I was um, really, really appreciative of the opportunity to read this. You saw the four themes. I don't need to uh, uh, redo those, but uh, let me just talk about a few things that resonated with me. Great statistics on war, war on average, war over two centuries, war for civil war, war for cross-border. I believe the thing that is going to actually impact our future is the kind of peace, not the kind of war, all right? Can we break out of a negotiated half-assed peace and find a real peace 
because what this region has been afflicted by and why EBRD has worse statistics on this historical war comparison is that we never have a resolution. We have conflict zones, we have continuing dark clouds, we have a rogue state in our midst that is intending on creating and leaving that kind of a dark cloud with us. So to my perspective, how we get to a peace is more important than what kind of war, though this war targeting civilian infrastructure is going to be at the worst end of a war regardless. But the peace gives us an ability to either unlock or be stuck in, in perpetual conflict overhang. Um, the other thing, okay, so let me move from that to uh, um, the uh, forced displacement. The, you know, when I look at this, um, the statistic was not up there, but what struck me, yes, 100 million displaced, but 33% of them are in the EBRD region. Um, that's a, a, a staggering number. And within that context, what I see uh, most encouraging is that the neighborhood states to Ukraine have actually responded in a way far beyond what I could have expected them to do as governments or as governments leading a people. Because the social unrest that could have happened in other parts of the world from accepting this kind of flow um, is not happening here. The question is, how long do we have? Don't, don't assume that we have that this can continue on. At some point, those pressures will build. The other concern I have is, and we saw it in some of the statistics up here, is that the repatriation will happen and it could happen at all at once and create an incredible reflow. And you were talking about uh, you know, refugees after other wars, but I get the impression that the great proportion of externally displaced people are just on their toes waiting to go back. With one exception, I spent a lot of time um, in, in the US with an entity working on uh, high impact entrepreneurs, founders, high tech um, people. And uh, you know, the, uh, the circumstantial evidence demonstrates to us that the high tech entrepreneurs, founders that are Ukrainian sourced have gravitated already to Silicon Valley. They got up and moved. And that is a great deficit that we are gonna have to reverse or get over with because that is the part of an economy these days that creates the employment, the growth, the dynamism. So that, that's one of the worries I have there. Supply chain, very interesting statistics because um, you know Hungary at the highest with 38%. I think it's 23% for the EBRD region as whole. Middle income countries like 16% in the uh, you know, global supply chain, trade and intermediate goods. Now, many of the alumni were here in the 1990s. It shouldn't surprise you that at the period of peak globalization, we, we're beginning our effort to deliver change to uh, the EBRD region. And what did we do? We, are, we were an agent in this. We created a story for FDI of high efficiency, low cost, and proximity. Why should you invest in Hungary at 38%? Because you're close and they have a high, um, edu highly educated labor force and it's efficient and it's low cost. So we were the agent that created this entity or this uh, characteristic of the supply chain. I was fascinated by some of the statistics Bayada had up there because I didn't get quite as deep into that particular chapter, um, but but she showed a lot of people already um, you know moving back. But she also in, you know, showed supply chain opportunity as not having changed. I worry that the supply chain will not return to what it was. That the Western European um, nations will not buy in to the same story as they did in the future. And where I'm going with that in a minute is how the decision process for investment going forward will play out. Okay, then we go to zombies. Love zombies, <laughs> love zombification, but I also love zombie super spreaders. Okay, <laughs> that's a, a, a term that we were discussing at lunch because what I worry about in, in the EBRD region is the uh, level of remaining state-owned enterprises, but particularly state-owned banks. And there are ever more zombies today because of a tendency in war anywhere to further centralize. So the Ukrainian government is not going to continue down the commercialization, privatization, transparency, governance direction or path while they're under attack for their survival. Centralization is natural. Centralization of a federalist system is natural. So we used to be able to deal with the municipalities as separate, separately from the government. 
The government's interfering with that. The government's interfering in the central bank. They're interfering with every one of the state-owned enterprises. So the whole question of governance, transparency, commercialization is moving against us uh, within the concept of, of zombies. And the state-owned banks with a central bank, I hope I'm not saying anything that doesn't like, I mean, the central bank is clearly not independent, all right? The SOBs are not independent. And all of this is working to our detriment today, and it will be something we have to overcome mm -hmm. and get back on track um, going forward. So let's think about investment for a minute. You know, I was uh, actually at a uh, reception at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City about six weeks ago. The, uh, the star of the show was Olena Zolenska, and she was mm -hmm. spectacular. There were so many corporate CEO types there saying, oh, we're going we're gonna to be part of this. We're going to be right in there in the reconstruction. And I think that kind of passion and that kind of heart is fantastic. And that may drive some investment in the very short run. But I think we're going to have a real problem from the point of view of corporate boardrooms in the U.S., in Western Europe, anywhere in the developed world. FDI is not going to be easy to come by. The investment climate is not going to return quickly, and no matter how many incremental reforms we put in place, they're going to be overshadowed by the gray clouds of a rogue nation in our midst that wants to keep all of these countries unstable. And they've done a great job so far, and that's our biggest goal is to try to find a way to combat that. Until we do that, the investment climate is going to work against us. Mm. Other things are going to work against us. The supply chain FDI argument. People aren't going to buy that going forward mm -hmm. until we have some clarity on the investment climate. Um, you know, the, the centralization is going to work against us. We had so many stories that we're telling about commercialization, privatization of, of state-owned banks that gave people comfort that we were moving in the right direction and gave us comfort that the governments were moving in the right direction. I hate to say it, but I, I believe Ukraine is uh, not going to be an easy um, counterparty to return to the reform orientation that we all anticipate. So it's going to be a struggle, and we just have to work with it. But let me go back to you know just quickly what was on the screen. All right, so war in the EBRD region. EBRD regions has suffered more in, the, in wars for various reasons. Whether it's a civil war or a cross-border war, I can't tell. Can you tell what kind of war this is? It's a, it's a deadly, dastardly war. Um, but wars are not average. Wars don't end easily. Peace is going to be fragile. And the question for us is, in a circumstance of massive uncertainty, how do you make decisions? All right. And, and that is incredibly difficult. And having run the investment committee in this room or this uh, institution for five years, um, 55 billion of investment, 2000 projects, making decisions is tough. Making a decision when you don't have your normal crutches for decision making is even tougher. You know, I used to talk all about RAYROC and ROWRAC and ROAC <laughs> and all these return measures. None of them make any sense in extreme uncertainty. There is no discussion of relevance about return in a risk environment like this. There's also no way to risk adjust a return or risk adjust capital when the risk is catastrophic and unimaginable and unanalyzable and uninsurable. So decisions are going to be more difficult. And what I wanted to do was give a shout out to every Everybody here who has enabled EBRD to make decisions in the last couple of months, because I can assure you, one, in Washington, where I spent a lot of time, it's noticed. There's a positive feedback loop that Washington trusted EBRD, gave you a certain amount of catalytic capital in the form of grants, and you were able to build on that, and you were able to deliver. And that feedback to greater comfort for them and greater comfort in other European and G7 capitals. So that was brilliant. What do we have on the sidelines? We have IFC, we have DFC, we have EIB. They're all whining. They don't have that catalytic capital. They don't have those grants and those guarantees. They're not able to do what you're doing. And they're not able to make the decisions you're making. Now, I know you're, you're making some decisions because you have an imperative to do something. Most everybody else would rather not make a decision. They'd rather avoid it. But you are. And so my plea to you is to continue on, stand tall, fill that void, show leadership when other people flail. Don't talk about it so much. Just do it. 
you know, I think you know, we've been more, you've been more successful because you're not out there beating the chest. Well, you know, we're European, we need to do this, or we're American, we need to do that. You're under the radar, you're doing it. And that is noticed by everybody. And that's to your admiration and your advantage. So I think uh, bottom line message for all of this, terrible circumstances, but stand, stand firm, stay focused, be proud. Bill, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thanks for engaging intellectually. You didn't disappoint on that, and you were thoughts are provoking and provocative, as usual. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sabina, let me cross to you in Brussels. Uh, how are you seeing it from where, from where you're sitting? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, I would have much preferred to be able to join you uh, in person in Canary Wharf, so I think my visit to uh, your new premises has to wait for another, for another day. But um, I'm very happy to uh, be able to comment uh, from a trade policy perspective on this very rich uh, report. And uh, I think business unusual is indeed a very appropriate term. I think we are living through uh, epochal change and we don't really know where we will end up with this. So I think we have to accept, I don't know whether I would call it a perma crisis or a poly crisis, but what is clear is that we see the order we were used to disappearing before our eyes. Uh, this is due to the geostrategic rivalries that have already marked the international scene uh, for, for uh, years uh, before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, struck. Uh, then we've had Russia's invasion of Ukraine with all the consequences that this has uh, on, in terms of human misery, of course, but also in terms of the threatened food security across the globe, um, the soaring energy prices, um, we see a general tendency of a weaponization of interdependencies that has become the new normal. And um, the result of all this, for different reasons, has been an increasing role of the state in the economy, which is normal in, wartime, in the wartime economy, um, which is very much the way that the um, COVID-19 crisis started. But of course, now we have really moved to a war type uh, economy, at least in parts of our continent. And that brings with it particular challenges because it raises the question of how do we articulate in the future the role of the state and the role of private uh, businesses. And here I come to the issue of uh, the fragility of supply chains that have been highlighted in, in your report. And I think I would like to summarize that as a challenge of resiliency beats efficiency. Um, and uh, I think Beata has uh, set out uh, the, uh, or summarized the results of the report in terms of what business is doing in order to reorganize its supply chains in line with this new imperative of just in case and not just in time as the mantra for the organization. And uh, here I think though, uh, and I very much agree with what Ivan Krastev said, about this issue of uh, French shoring. And uh, I like the, the thought experiment of dividing the global economy along the lines of the vote in the UN General Assembly, but that is not what French shoring or reshoring is about. Um, when you listen to the debates there, I think what we would see is a world economy fracturing along more fault lines than just uh, the vote in the UN General Assembly. Um, I really think, uh, I agree also with Ivan Krastev that we see the rise of uh, middle powers, and these middle powers do not want to choose a lane. Uh, they will want to shape their own destiny, just like we want to do that also in, uh, in Europe. And the idea of organizing the global economy um, in gated communities of um, economies that share the same values, um, I think that doesn't work. What we see is that even where you have resiliency uh, trumping efficiency, you still need to make sure that your supply chains are commercially viable. And that will trump any consideration of, uh, 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 of uh, organizing, um, organizing uh, supply chains according to friendship. So it's resiliency, it's efficiency, but friendship I don't think plays that much of a role there. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is um, we need to rediscuss the respective roles of public authorities versus businesses. 
um, because I think there may be a tendency to think that it is state actors that organize supply chains. Well, I don't think that state actors, public authorities have the superior knowledge uh, that would allow them to do that in a centralized uh, manner. I mean, the advantage of market economies and of uh, businesses uh, taking decisions, uh, managing their own risks, is that you do not have one central decision that can go badly wrong, but you have a multitude of decisions uh, which uh, where at least some people are bound to get it right, and that you can discover what are the right solutions uh, through a trial and error uh, approach, which is much more difficult if you have things organized uh, by public authority. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, obviously, I mean, speaking for the European Commission on trade matters, you would not expect me uh, to say that there is no role for public authorities. But I think what I see government action is, uh, as is an enabling action that helps businesses uh, providing a framework for the diversification of their inputs and the diversification of their export markets. Uh, because that is what I think we need for both efficiency and for resiliency. We are doing that through our traditional trade agreements, uh, but also multilaterally. But we are also doing it increasingly uh, with a focus on the new challenges, the green transition, the, di the digital transformation, uh, where we are looking at energy and raw materials as the decisive uh, factors uh, to help us with uh, these uh, transitions. And here uh, we are promoting um, framework agreements, partnership agreements on raw materials, on green hydrogen, uh, in order to reduce the risk which has increased, uh, 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 as Phil has, uh, has clearly set out. So I think um, public authorities up to a point can try to create more predictability through rules and frameworks in which then business decisions have to uh, have to uh, take place. Um, and I th I'm looking forward to a uh, further discussion. We certainly live through an enormous period of, of uncertainty and epical change, as I said, but it is not something that we should uh, see as something we undergo. It is something that we have to shape through decisive action, both at the level of public authorities and businesses. And I think I will stop here to leave sufficient time for the discussion. Thank you. Sabina, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I like your thought that we do have some agency in this process. You know, we're not uh, just being done to. We have the ability to do something. Uh, I think that's probably quite important. Uh, Beata, you've been listening to, to this. So let me pick up on one of the themes that ran through all the comments, increased role of the state. Um, some of you may remember that two years ago, our transition report was entitled, The State Strikes Back. And it presented a little known statistic showing that support for democracy is much larger than support for private ownership. If you ask people, is it important for you to live in a democracy, in pretty much every country, three quarters of people will say yes. If you ask people, uh, are you in favor of a greater role of private ownership in your economy, the picture is much more mixed. Uh, anywhere between a third and, you know, three quarters of people will say yes. And, you know, US and Japan are outliers in terms of their support for private ownership. But in Spain, it's only 30% of people um, who are supported. And if history is any guide, we know that people who grew up during recessions are more suspicious of free markets and they are much more positively predisposed towards the state playing a greater role in the economy. So after the pandemic, after the current downturn, we can expect more and more people favoring greater role of the state in the economy. Now, where does it leave the EBRD? Uh, our colleagues from the legal transition team looked at the frameworks governing state-owned enterprises in the context of that report two years ago, and the picture was not pretty actually even the legal frameworks, and we are not even talking about implementation, are pretty poor. And that's where we as an institution can play a role, especially since in this environment of um, pressures, of, of higher cost of borrowing, higher costs of servicing that, 
governments may have an incentive to improve the workings of SOEs and perhaps even privatization. I very much agree with Phil that you know, we should be careful when working with state-owned banks so that we don't create zombie super spreaders. And why am I so hooked on zombies? Well, because zombies trap labor and capital in those not very productive activities. But with the green transition, we need to allow big structural changes to happen in the economy. And that means releasing capital and labor so that they can move to these new activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piazza. Um, if you've got some questions in the audience, by the way, in a few minutes, we might take one or two. Hopefully we'll have a bit of time for that before 5.30. Uh, but let's uh, carry on this discussion. Uh, maybe, Ivan, I'll come back to you. Now, we've heard a lot. Obviously, we've talked about perma-crisis. I think Sabina used the phrase poly-crisis, actually. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> we're dealing with many, many poly-crises at the same time. Um, but how do you think policymakers have risen to the challenge of dealing with perma-crisis or, or poly-crises? What uh, consequences do you think they have for, for our politics? Uh, yeah, uh, just to make one point, because uh, for me, this is quite important, this story, and I agree very much that in the time of recession, people expect much more from the state. But there is something different that we saw for the last 15 years. For example, in the 1920s, after the Great uh, Depression, basically people started to mistrust the market but they believe that the government can deliver. In 1970s, it was the other way around. Basically, people stopped trusting uh, uh, the government and they believe that the market will deliver. In my view, what we are seeing today is that we have people mistrusting both market and the government. And this is different. Uh, you have a mistrust of the government, which is not compensated very much in the trust in the state. And here you're also going to have a major divide in Europe between East and West. And this is very much also uh, even now quite clear. This was clear during the COVID crisis, how basically the businesses reacted. Uh, because during the COVID crisis, it was better to be a company than a person. Mm. Because uh, people that should not have died, died. <laughs> but at the same time, company that should have died too stayed alive. Mm. Uh, 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 but this kind of immortality of the companies with the increased mortality of the people uh, uh, was reacted very differently because in a countries in which there was a much trust in the government, uh, basically people had the feeling that they see this as a temporal, as basically what is going to be the response. For me, one of the major challenge to the policy makers is to explain what is a temporary measures and what is a new policy normal? A and this is going to be a really difficult game. Especially if the war lasts a very long period of time. Actually. Listen, in a certain way, honestly speaking, the war is going to last longer than we expect because also for the economies of European Union, what it means that the war is ending. Mm. Even if you're going to have a ceasefire, I cannot easily see basically the peace treaty that is going to agree on whole basically uh, owns what. And as a result of it, I cannot easily uh, see a change in the sanction policies in a big way and others. So uh, from this point of view, there are different scenarios, but for me, the prolonged war in one way or the other is a much more likely scenario than the war that is going to stop tomorrow. Phil, you put up your hand. Well, I was gonna also suggest that this, this trend of centralization in, in the minds of, many policymakers that I listen to and I sense an undertone is that many of them, particularly in the Ukrainian context in various committees and commissions I'm on in US, they don't believe in the fundamental value of reform anymore. So it's gonna be even harder to persuade them that they should go down this path. I think part of it is that they never got more than halfway down the path mm -hmm. on any particular you know, stream, work stream, and so they never saw the full benefit. But to persuade them that they should be privatizing the Ukrainian state banks right now, or even in the future, after the war, is going to be yeah. much more difficult. They're used to it. They want that control. And I hate to say it, the heroes that are going to you know, lead Ukraine out of this problem are going to have more self-satisfaction and less time for reform. Mm. And so that, that's 
part of what I was trying to say with centralization is we're not going to be talking to people that actually believe what we believe. In the past, they might have believed it, but they couldn't deliver it. Now the question is, do they actually really believe it anymore? Also, how do you reform a country, you know, as we take the, the Ukraine example, when they're likely to have no infrastructure? You know, there could be other priorities, aren't there? Sure, sure. So, I mean, that's also going to delay reform. There's going to be a reform lag of you know, well, five, and, 10 and, years, whatever it might be. And again, it go goes back to my FDI concerns. It is going to be so much more difficult to get FDI up and running anytime soon. So we're going to, in my mind, the balance is going to shift more to trying to get domestic players mm. up and running. But FDI sit in a boardroom anywhere in the US, you know, London, Western Europe, they might do an investment for passion, for heart, for whatever. But the comparison between Ukraine and Brazil or Vietnam is going to work against them yep. because of the supply chain concerns, because of the, uh, the centralization concerns, because of everything we've been talking about, we have to rebuild momentum because the momentum is slipping away from us and we have to change it back. Um, but the last thing I want to say is I love transition. Uh, you know, when I first got here, I thought transition impact from just doing any investment was good enough. All right. And slowly, but surely people slap some sense in it. Hmm. All right. So now I accept transition qualities, but to a certain extent, we got to go back in the time of massive uncertainty in the time of conflict we have to get the investment flowing and, and the investment unto itself is transitional. It's survival oriented. Um, and uh, so I, I never give up on transition, but don't overlay it. Don't, you know, at this point in time, find a way to get the, the stuff moving. And that's going to be difficult enough without layering in certain other aspects to it. Beata knew I was going to say yeah, that. Yeah, she's she, smiling, she, I can she, see. She back, you know. <laughs> uh, thank you, Phil. Sabina, <laughs> Sabina let me uh, go to you in Brussels. I mean, you, you talked uh, a few minutes ago about uh, not fooling ourselves to believe that we can uh, build gated communities in trade or walled gardens, uh, that's that sort of thing. So it is quite difficult, isn't it, to crisis-proof trade. You can't really do that, you know, supply chains. Uh, can't be protected 100%. But what can you do? What When you're sitting there in Brussels and you're thinking about trade, what are the options now? Well, I think, uh, first of all, um, we uh, I think the key word is diversification. Um, that is essential for resilience of supply chains. And there are good studies, including from the OECD, that show that the more um, diversified supply chains are, the more resilient they are. And that is something we can try to support uh, through our trade policy. That is what we are doing, uh, for instance, uh, by reviving our the bilateral trade agenda so that we offer new outlets uh, uh, to companies, uh, opening up new export markets, but notably also looking at where do we need to uh, make sure that we have substitutability of inputs. So we've done an analysis of what our uh, dependence is uh, on strategic uh, imports of inputs from China, learning the lessons also from the experience we have now made with Russia. And I think here we will have to uh, promote alternatives. That is what we are doing also with raw materials partnerships, uh, etc. Um, so I think this uh, the, the trade is, is part of, of the reply to that but it cannot answer all uh, questions and it cannot reduce uh, the risk to zero. And in the end, you know, it, remain, it is business that remains in charge of organizing uh, these supply chains. At the same time, we also need to keep a sense of perspective. Um, interdependence does not equal vulnerability. Um, I just mentioned China, we've looked at uh, the data and we see that about 6% of our trade with China is strategically uh, relevant and where we have problems of substitutability, uh, where we are dependent uh, on, on China as uh, basically the only source of inputs. That is where we need to invest. But it also means that 94% of our trade is strategically not relevant. And there's no point in going for a massive uh, decoupling. Uh, that actually, I think, would uh, increase vulnerability uh, because that would then promote or um, would basically uh, uh, accelerate uh, 
a trend uh, towards fragmentation of the global economy, which means that we will not have the economies of scale and the efficiency that we need, notably to finance uh, the, the, the green uh, transition. Thank you, Sabina. And Phil, I'm coming to you in just a second anyway. Um, if anybody's got a question, we'll come to that uh, in a couple of minutes. So think of your question. We'll try and take one or two uh, in the last few minutes. Phil, you wanted to react anyway, but uh, Sabina mentioned there the importance of business leaders, some things you can leave to business leaders, uh, particularly on things that, that maybe not, not so core. Uh, but do you think business is more adaptable to the, to the shifts that we're seeing, those tectonic shifts? Are, are business leaders better able to navigate than the politicians and the governments? Uh, in effect, what you said a few minutes ago is when it comes down to hard cash, they're going to be weighing up where best to, to put their investment. So it's, it's still going to come down to a good business decision, which, of course, may not help uh, the areas that are suffering. Let me come to that in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just wanted to associate myself with your statements on China. Um, to me, China is a huge problem still to be fleshed out, but we can make it worse by doing things bluntly. And I'm afraid that the U.S. is not quite as sophisticated in the way they describe this discussion as you just described it, uh, at least in public. I hope some people behind the scenes are, but China is a huge risk for the U.S. Well, you know, you're in the same boat as the U.S. on semiconductors, you've done the same thing with tax incentives, research subsidies, all those things to bring uh, chips back uh, into your home country. But there are so many other areas like that. But to your point, I am naturally biased mm -hmm. to believe that private sector can find a way forward. But I, I am also sure that we've demonstrated many times in the the you know, however many years, but certainly the last few years, where we've been obtuse or the private sector has been obtuse, um, hasn't moved as quickly as they could, didn't think the the war would happen, for example, didn't prepare themselves for it. Um, but I do think after the fact, what's interesting is, is that corporate America has actually stood up, and this is a slightly different perspective or point that you were making, corporate America has stood up in the sanctions regime, in the Russia situation, and multiplied what the sanctions were doing. And it was for their own branding. Mm -hmm. It was for their own moral and ethical satisfaction and sanity. It was for their employees. But the sanctions didn't require companies to do what they did yeah. do. And I'm proud that they did do it. And I believe that U.S. corporates and business more broadly, whether it's on this or other issues of social importance, that companies need to take a stand and be at the forefront and not hide and not be timid. You know, we've got to get past this political partisan attack on business. And I believe business has to take it on to themselves. But I, I, I'm biased, but I fundamentally believe that there have been too many examples where business has been slow to react, uh, not on Russia but it has been slow to react uh, on other areas. And partly it was fear. The last mm. four years was a period of fear, mm. not the last four, the, the prior four years, prior to two years ago, uh, for being called out, for mm. being trashed by a, a government, out of, a rogue government of our own. Um, but I do believe that the, the corporate sector has the opportunity to be nimble, can move faster than the government, but works best when they are working with the government, not in opposition to the government. Thank you, Phil. Um, does anybody have a question they would like to ask the audience? If you do put Let up your hand. Let me make just one sentence. Oh, because Yvan, it's just a sentence. Uh, but before you do, Ivan wants to. Yeah, the, but it's a sentence. <laughs> because in my view, the interesting story is the businesses, you know, the, to be businesses, they always prefer to think in the best case scenarios. And now the government starts to think in the worst case scenarios. And if they're not going to be a balance between two of them, they'll continue living in a kind of a parallel world. Yeah. So uh, it's the time for people to work together in that sense. Uh, right. If you want to put up your hand and ask a question, then you can do that. Yes, uh, we can bring a microphone down here to the second row. Hello, uh, my question is uh, regarding the zombie firms you mentioned. I have two questions, in fact. One is, uh, is there any 
data or information about the sizes of those zombie firms. Are they particularly SMEs or large corporates? And uh, related to the to that, uh, I see in various of charts regarding showing negative impacts of those zombie firms to the economies. Uh, what is our argument here? Are we saying th those firms shouldn't be financed and let uh, allow them to go bankrupt? And if so, isn't it going to create and trigger further economic uh, economic distress? Yeah, sir. An excellent question, right? So zombie firms are firms that are artificially kept alive by subsidized financing. So in other words, they are getting credit, not they are not being charged market interest rates, they are getting subsidized credit. And this may happen because state-owned banks are instructed to prevent job losses before elections, that's one example, or because banks are undercapitalized and they don't want to recognize non-performing loans because that would make their capital structure look worse. So the problem with zombie firms are that they are firms that would not be alive, they would not be operating if they were subject to market conditions. So the fact that they are able to do it is a distortion. And by keeping workers and capital trapped inside, they are preventing a flow of capital and labor to uh, other usage. So the question, uh, I'm gonna take it in a different direction, is from an EBRD point of view, how do you operationalize in the moment, in real time, this concern about zombies. I'm I'm totally on side with this as a cautionary tale, as a theoretical structure. But if we were in OPSCOM dealing with a state-owned enterprise or a large corporate that receives a lot of its money at a subsidized level from a state-owned bank, am I going to say no because I want to choke it? Don't think so. You know, from the point of view, you know, maybe it's just our bias here, but we would try to find a way to de-zombify it in some sense and move it away from that. But I do think this broad concern is more of a concern, in my mind, from the point of view of the policymakers, but it's a concern from our point of view to convince the policymakers that they should be creating better regulatory environments, particularly insolvency regimes in their countries so that the, the they're so that you know zombie banks, state owned banks won't try to keep a zombie alive because they're afraid that they will you know suffer the uh, the damage of an NPL, for example. We need better insolvency regimes in these countries. We need better central banks because the central bank, if it's not independent, it's keeping the state owned bank you know going, directing the state owned bank, to deliver zombie ammunition, all right? You were talking about, do we have data? The, the data I liked was state-owned enterprises, 13% uh, of them, I think, are zombies. Private sector companies, 9% are zombies. So there is a tangible, substantial difference, but the state-owned banks are keeping the state-owned enterprises alive. They're pretending and extending these loans, all right? And it's because there is weak policy oversight of insolvency regimes in these countries. So can we influence that? Can the policymakers influence? Bigger question, do the policymakers want to influence it? Because state-owned banks fund fiscal deficits. State-owned banks channel money to state-owned enterprises. State-owned banks are primarily, are, are much more prevalent in strategic zones of the economy, which is important to the government. So, you know, this is a, it's a hell of a debate. It's not clear that if you're talking to a governor of a central bank or a minister of finance, whether, you know, they might listen, but I don't think they're going to do much about it. And it's really in their court to do something because it's to their detriment to have suboptimal allocation of capital. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I'll take one more quick question. Uh, the gentleman at the very back got his hand up first. So... <clears throat> Oh, keep going. <laughs> Walk to the very back. How about that? By the way, one of the greatest discussions we ever had while I was here was about the Greek systemic banks. Yep. Here were the four super zombie super spreaders. All right. They were private banks nationalized. 
And we were trying to denationalize them, reprivatize them, get them back in the public sector. It was one of the biggest debates we ever had in this institution. And fortunately, we took it on and we worked with them and we recapitalized the zombie super spreaders of Greece. And you know, it was it was necessary that we did. It was an imperative, but it created so much antagonism and angst and anxiety at every level of this institution. But we stuck with it. And actually, if we hadn't done that, the private sector wouldn't have come in. Would not have come in. It, yeah. Would not have yeah, come yeah. in. Can I come with political? Scientific very quick, context? very quickly. Because yeah. I do believe that the biggest problem is not that the zombies exist, but that you believe that they are alive. Mm. I can imagine a good idea for the governments mm. not to bury dead companies. Mm. For strategic reasons. Sure. The problem is not to pretend that they are alive. Mm -hmm. And from this point of view, this is not that you are not going to keep somebody in this. They could be a good strategic reasons to do it. But be sure that you're taking care of the dead. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen at the back, very quick question. Volodymyr Yakubov of BSI. A quick comment and quick question. Private companies do not normally operate on best case scenarios. They base their decisions on risk management. Um, question, uh, if Hungary blocks the aid package for the next year to Ukraine, 18 billion uh, euros, um, will the BRD be willing to find mechanisms to step in? <laughs> I doubt whether anybody on this panel wants to answer that question, but so... Uh... <laughs> We, uh, but isn't Sabina the closest? Yeah, I, I think I, I think Sabina would be well advised to pretend she didn't hear that question. Is that was it? <laughs> uh, it's a zombie question. Yeah, uh, I think the answer is we note your question. Thank you. Uh, okay, listen. So uh, let let's start to wrap up uh, and let's look at the results. We asked you at the beginning of our discussion, of course. So what does business unusual mean for you? Uh, this is what you uh, told us. Uh, Disruption caused by war, so the biggest uh, number, inability to plan long term. That's what it means for a lot of people uh, and all of the above. Which so, inability to plan yeah. long term is inability to make decisions, yeah, yeah. which I think is is going, is going to be the fundamental problem for yeah. an institution like this, but more, more the private sector. I think that's another reason, isn't it, why disruption is going to be a lot longer than we think, actually, yeah. even even once we come to the end of this, because, the, again, the time lag factor must be quite large. Um, OK, so let's uh, have some concluding thoughts. Maybe I'd like to ask you all very, very quickly, all of our panel, for one key thing that you think we should bear in mind as we go into this very uncertain future, just one thing that should be at the very front of our minds. Sabina, I'm going to go to you in Brussels, first of all, as you were nodding vigorously. So, um, I think the main thing is we have agency here. This is not something where we are just exposed to forces over which we have absolutely no influence. We have the possibility to act and we have the duty to act in order to shape the next phase of globalization. Thank you. I should uh, just continue. We have agency as Europe. Voter voters also has agencies in their national elections. And this is quite important to keep these agencies in a good relations with each other. Mm. Oh. You've heard enough for me, but I'm just gonna put one word out there, something that is could make this a lot worse, which is China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's yeah. hope, all right. In the, yeah. in, you know, China is very much on everybody's mind in, in the U.S., much more so, I think, than in, in European capitals or Brussels. And that very concern can create even more negative feedback. But uh, the, the, the level of concern and the level of desire to protect ourselves from su supply disruptions and conflict with China is very, very high. Yeah, see, I'm an optimist, Phil, so I always think that China is a lot more thoughtful about the way it goes around these things than perhaps uh, what we've seen in recent years from, from Russia. So I suppose I remain optimistic, but uh, I recognize hopeful. it's definitely... But, you know, yeah. but what I'm really yeah. saying is China <laughs> yeah, yeah. may not be the problem. Yeah. It's the way we perceive yes, China yeah. and is perceived in Washington to be much more dangerous than I think mm. it is here. Yeah. Beata. So sticking to the with the theme of agency, right? We can do something, but... Let's not address current problems by creating problems in the future, by kicking the can down the road. 
Thank you very much. And thank you to our panel, to Beata, Ivan, Phil, to Sabina, of course, in Brussels, to Odile, who opened our discussion today. Um, thank you to all of you as well for being part of this exciting event, the very first uh, in this auditorium. You can download the full transition report or read it all online, 2022.tr-ebrd.com. You can see that uh, hopefully on the screen up there behind me. We'll be posting a podcast of today's session later. You can download it on iTunes and, of course, reviewing and rating it helps others to find us, so we quite like that. Uh, I'm Jonathan Charles. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs>